Good day, everyone. My name is Mike Cusack, and welcome to GEDS's first virtual summit of 2021. Uh, I'm expecting an audience of about 550 people, so this is going to be a popular topic, and I'm looking forward to lots of questions at the end. I would ask that you hold your questions to the end. We're going to leave as much time as possible for you to have discussions with the Clinical Advisory Board. My name is Mike Cusack. I'm the Executive Director of GEDSA. I have uh, spent about 30 years in medical diagnostics, drug discovery, and contract manufacturing, and that's where I jumped over to GEDSA when I was involved with one of our members as a contract manufacturer, and I was responsible for the enteral feeding business. After that, I was a GEDSA secretary, and I've been in place as the director of GEDSA for almost three years now. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping details I want to cover. Uh, first and most importantly is the antitrust agreement. GETSA is a nonprofit trade group, uh, a 501c6 corporation. What that means is that we're subject to antitrust regulations. So if you ever have a concern about um, inappropriate behavior from a GETSA member regarding price fixing, market collusion, et cetera, please bring that immediately to my attention. Um, I have no conflicts of interest, whether per professionally or personally in this presentation or in GEDSA itself. Let's take a look at the summit agenda. The purpose today of my presentation is to give you the opportunity to get some education and increase your awareness of the small bore connector misconnections, the ISO 80369 standard, and how it led to hospitals converting to the new standard. So my goals for you are to help you uh, understand the ISO 80369 standard, understand the importance of the enteral connector, which we'll talk about in great detail, and to alert you to, to the fact that some of you may have, many of you may have already converted, uh, begun the conversion process and not even realize it. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Then to point out what product changes you need to be made aware of and, and share some experiences with large healthcare systems that have already made the transition and finally, to understand what GEDSA can do to help you make this transition um, in the next several, uh, in, the, in the future. So GEDSA's mission is to promote patient safety worldwide through the adoption of a family of ISO compliant connectors. The first of which is the um, ISO 80369-3 connector, it's commonly known as NFIT, as well as the neuraxial or regional anesthesia connector which is commonly known as NRFIT. Both of these connectors are on the market and they're the first two members of a family co of connectors that ISO is developing the standards for. GETSA is made up of a large group. We're about 35 uh, global manufacturers of enteral feeding devices. If you take a close look here, you'll probably recognize some, if not many of the companies are already companies that you're working with. Um, our, our membership grows as we expand into the different geographies launching this initiative. In addition to our membership, we have strong support from a variety of professional and clinical uh, groups. So on the top right, you'll see Aspen, Aspen and its sister organizations, Braspin, Jaspin, and Espen. Those are all the enteral, uh, parenteral and enteral um, uh, societies for the various regions of Europe, Japan, Brazil, and the States. In addition, we work closely with regulatory agencies like the Joint Commission and FDA. We also work with uh, the ISMP as well as with a variety of uh, large GPOs and other organizations. Finally, we also are involved closely with the OLI Foundation, which is a patient advocacy group. So before I get into the meat of the presentation, I would like to point out what this is not. This conversion is not a hospital initiative. It's not a clinical initiative. It's not even a manufacturer initiative. And certainly it's not a GEDSA initiative. What this is, is an ISO patient safety initiative. So ISO is the, the, the genesis of this new set of standards. ISO is the organization that's strongly encouraging folks to adopt it. And the ISO initiative is supported by not only our membership, but also these other organizations that I just pointed out. I think it's easy to lose sight 
of the human element of these initiatives. Sometimes these can seem somewhat arbitrary or bureaucratic, kind of remote. And, it, and, and frankly, in some cases, it may be looked at as a chore. But I think it's important to understand that at the end of all of these types of initiatives, there are humans, people that experience real effects from some of these initiatives. And I'd like to give us all a chance to hear one family's story in their own words.
Okay, let's get out of this. So I can speak, I think, confidently on behalf of the Gedser membership and probably most of the attendees the, the reason we get up in the morning is to help stop these things from happening. So let's, let's turn our attention now to, you know, how we got to this point where these connectors needed to be standardized in order to prevent these type of tragedies. And one thing I'll point out in, in that, uh, there's, an un, there's another group of people that are equally devastated by a misconnection event, and that's the caregivers themselves. Right? You can imagine someone whose primary motivation is to care for people and, and make them better. What might be the effect of a misconnection event? So in 1896, Carl Schneider Luer, who was a scientist in France, he invented an all glass syringe with a tapered connection because the connections at the time were haphazard, not particularly reliable. And his idea was to come up with a taper fit that with friction and pressure would connect two devices and not require any kind of packing material. Um, this proved to be so successful that by the early 1900s, there was a wide array of hypodermic and intravenous injection products that were available. And, and it became a widely used de facto standard. One interesting note from a historical perspective, at the time, uh, the actual inventor of this concept was Carl Luer's wife, Marie. Um, unfortunately, at the time, the French uh, patent office didn't recognize women as being valid inventors, so the patent credit went to him as opposed to his wife. Um, in 1930, uh, an American, Fairley S. Dickinson, invented an improvement on the, the lure connector, this tapered fit. You can imagine the, the original design with increasing pressure, the taper would, would want to respond by popping out. Uh, Fairley Dickinson's invention was the, the addition of two interlocking cams. So with a quarter turn tr twist, there was a positive connection between the male and the female side, and that prevented these pressure pops. Um, Fairley Dickinson went on to found Beckton Dickinson, which is a major supplier of medical devices worldwide. He also founded a, a, a university on the East Coast, Fairley Dickinson University. These new kinds of connectors took off in such, uh, in such a way that by the 1950s, they were used widely, um, particularly when the US polio vaccine campaign took off. Um, these connectors were viewed as really useful in terms of getting syringes set up and inoculating large groups of people. However, these glass syringes needed to be autoclaved between each patient and in 1961, a physician, Dr. Albert Weiner, was convicted of 12 counts of auto, uh, sorry, of manslaughter because he had failed to properly sterilize the devices from one patient to the next. And you can imagine the effect was to dramatically increase the use of disposable syringes such that within a few months, the production of these plastic syringes had jumped up three and four fold to the point where by the 1960s, companies like Abbott Laboratories, Baxter, and B. Braun had united behind the lure style connector as a standard. The problem was that the, there wasn't an official standard, so the various manufacturers' uh, connectors were, were somewhat different in terms of tolerances and oftentimes wouldn't connect together properly or wouldn't connect together at all. So in 1978, the American National Standards Institute formally established a lure taper standard. Um, that ANSI standard was the first national standard and it allowed manufacturers and their customers, the hospitals or anybody else using the devices to be uh, confident that a device purchased from one manufacturer would interact properly, connect properly with devices from another manufacturer. 
Now, in 1988, there was another hinge point in history during a United States Air Force aerobatic show in Ramstein, Germany. Um, the Italian National Air Force team ex had a uh, mid-air collision. Two planes crashed into one another. You can see in the upper left-hand corner, those two planes, uh, the debris landed in a crowd of hundreds of thousands of people below. Outright, 70 people were killed and hundreds were injured by a variety of mishaps, uh, debris, fire, fuel, all kinds of mayhem on the ground. The local Air Force and German EMTs responded quickly, began administering therapy, performing triage. The problem came up when it became apparent that there were two different connector standards in use on the field that day. The Germans were using the Raycord connector and the Americans were using the Lure connector and they were incompatible. And that led to the next step in standardization, which was the Lure connector itself. Now, like lots of successful innovations, uh, the lure connector contains a uh, little bit of its own Achilles heel. And that is because these connectors are easy to manufacture, they're relatively cheap to manufacture, they're very reliable and they're easy to use, they became pervasive in medical devices. Anytime a device was launched, and recall that minimally invasive uh, therapies became more and more prominent as miniaturization took hold, people naturally turn to the devices, uh, new devices naturally turn to the lure connector as a way to connect. And therein lies the problem because as you have more and more devices relying on the same connector, they can interact inappropriately at times by mistake and create problems such as we heard earlier. This, this uh, phenomenon became such a, uh, a concern that uh, ECRI, the Emergency Care Research Institute, uh, listed its top 10 technology hazards, two of which were directly related to medical device connectivity, and one was specifically related to enteral feeding misconnections. Because as we've seen, a uh, misconnection involving uh, enteral feeding solution can be quickly fatal. Later in 2010, Simmons et al. looked at 116 cases in the literature uh, and of those 116, 21 patients died, about 18%. Um, I'll point out that the mortality rate from typhoid and SARS is about 20%. So we're looking at a fairly significant uh, mortality rate. Also, as another point of comparison, last year during uh, May, the COVID pandemic in the United States, the fatality rate crested at about 6.2%. So while there aren't many cases of this, these misconnection events happening, they can be serious and not just in terms of death. I've listed below some of the other findings from the Simmons review. You can see where the um, adverse events include serious conditions that have permanent effects oftentimes on a patient and their families. Here's a, a listing of some of the tubing misconnection events in more detail. You'll see that there are ones uh, here labeled uh, with death as the outcome. I'll let you take a moment to look at this and then we'll continue. So we had, we had heard earlier about Robin and her, her child. This is a picture of her firstborn. Um, and, and you ask yourself, how can this situation happen in an advanced country in an advanced hospital with highly trained staff. Robin was uh, an employee of the hospital she was being treated in, as was her mother. So how can this happen? Well, if you look here, there are a variety of different factors, any one of which, or in combination with others, can cause a misconnection event. So things like low lighting, lots of technology connections around a patient or multiple lines, time pressure, fatigue, which I think is particularly of particular concern now with the pandemic causing a surge of patients into the hospitals and particularly into I, ICUs. Um, you have lack of tactile feedback with these friction fit connectors, connectors and, and things like unintended use or off-label use of tubes. All of these things can lead to an adverse event. So here is a hospital uh, setting um, and you can see there is a plethora of technology around this patient. In fact, on average, if you as a patient are in the hospital for more than three days, you're, you'll come in contact with up to 14 different uh, types, different types of hospital technology. 
And what's kind of amazing to think about it here is right in the middle of all this, there's our patient. So you can, you can quickly understand how under time pressure or low lighting or the pandemic, I mean, recall right now in the ICUs, you have this influx of patients who are on ventilators. Patients on ventilators require nutrition. They can't be given orally. So these patients are all on enteral nutrition. And the common practice has evolved during the pandemic to do put the patients in the wards and the pumps out in the hallway so the, the nurses and the other support staff do not have to gown up and gown down every time they go in to change enteral nutrition. So that leads to even more connections. And I would argue that now in the face of the pandemic and the heavy use of technology and the opportunity for misconnections being as high as ever, this would be an opportune moment because if ever a misconnection was going to happen, it would be now with the condition, conditions being what they are. Now is the time to make the change to a uh, new connector that's, that's safer, the ISO 80369-3 series. In response to all of these findings, research, uh, adverse events, ISO took notice of this and convened a global effort to create better conditions for patient safety. So what ISO did, the International Standards Organization, was to draw uh, groups of technical experts, clinical experts, and regulatory standards experts together to come up with a standard called ISO 80369 to govern the connection of small bore connectors. Um, things that are based on uh, connectors like the lower lock or the Christmas tree. So these are the design standards that the ISO 80369 series dash one, which establishes the general criteria. These are the connectors that are going to be coming out. And as I've mentioned, the enteral connection is already out. That's the second one over dash three. Neuraxial is also out. That's the second to the last dash six. And, and the idea here is to engineer human error out of the system because that's where the problems arise. Anytime you have people involved, there's opportunities for mistakes. Airlines have taken extraordinary steps towards eliminating human error. The military has taken extraordinary steps towards human error. Um, I can give you one specific example of no, there was no fatalities involved, but in 1999, the Mars Climate uh, Explorer took off from Earth for landing on Mars. It was a $125 million project uh, jointly developed by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and Lockheed Martin. The problem came about when the Mars Explorer was, was in, in the process of landing. It broke apart because it failed to withstand the pressures of the landing. Why did that happen? Because in development, JPL developed the lander around English Standard measurements and the Lockheed Martin actually built the craft around metric measurements. Those were two incompatible uh, measurement systems and therefore the structural integrity of the craft broke up and we lost $125 million uh, device on the way down to what could have been a successful landing. Fortunately, no, no people died, but it's a, an example of how human error on a very obvious basis can cause problems. So what did ISO do to help prevent that? The first and fundamental rule is that each connector cannot be compatible with connectors in other families. So how do we do that? We establish different diameters for the devices. And the way that happens is in the lower right-hand corner, you can see a virtual cone. If you slice that cone at different points uh, along the cone, you come up with circles of different diameters. Each diameter is assigned to one of the families. So right off the bat, you have incompatibility built into the actual devices themselves. Next, the requirement is that these devices are made out of rigid or semi-rigid material. So those of you that are familiar with the funnel connectors and the Christmas trees, they operate by friction fit. You press them in, the female side conforms and grabs on by friction to the male side and that's how the connection is made. Now, not only can you force fit something together, but also as we've seen earlier with Carl Leward's original standard, under pressure, you can have these things pop apart easily and you can get the phenomenon of feeding the bed. So the material is important. Next, ISO requires that these devices pass a whole series of pretty rigorous tests, starting off with uh, engineering tests, FMEA analysis it's called, to make sure the devices actually work 
function the way they're intended to from a design standpoint. The next set of testing is human factors uh, testing, and that is to make sure the devices work the way they're supposed to in a clinical setting with real people. So once the devices pass those, those tests, they become approved. And finally, the, the devices in these standards, the connectors in the standard, cannot be compatible with the lure connector, which we learned was the original uh, small bore connector, nor can it be compatible with any of these safety needleless uh, connectors. So the way I think about it is, it's kind of like an umbrella. An umbrella is only good if it's intact. If every pane is functional, you can stand under the umbrella and be protected from getting wet. We're just starting to build a safety umbrella here. We have two of the panes introduced. The first one is the enteral feeding uh, connector, dash three. The next one is neuraxial, dash six. As we introduce new families of connectors, such as respiratory, which is in circulation right now, we're building our umbrella. And when the umbrella is finished, we'll have the maximum amount of patient safety by having this uh, approach of engineering human error out of the system. I mentioned earlier that we have support from a wide array of clinical and regulatory agencies. Um, here's some examples of that. The FDA has released a letter that encourages, strongly encourages their word, the use of enteral device connectors. And these recommendations apply to hospitals, manufacturers, and distributors. The Joint Commission uh, had a Sentinel Alert number 53 that it released some time ago, I think it was four years ago, maybe five, but it was recently released in March it was sent out as a still relevant communication to the Joint Commission's 4,000 member physician leaders group uh, saying that the Joint Commission still supported the move towards the ISO 80369 connectors. CMS had a similar alert on lure misconnection events. Um, Aspen has come out strongly as a clinical organization, professional organization supporting the move to the new connectors. And then finally, just this past March, uh, one of our members sponsored a symposium webinar uh, with ISMP and ECRI, and that statement uh, is available on their website, also strongly in support of the move to adoption of the ISO 80369-3 connectors. In addition to that, we have uh, legacy device sunset provisions that the membership, the GEDSA membership, have taken. And what that means is that in July of this year, Get some member manufacturers will begin phasing out production of legacy devices and following that in January of legacy device adapters. So what that means is that um, get some members are going to be stopping production. They'll continue to sell the devices and the connectors so long as inventories last. The idea is to help hospitals make the transition by using up existing inventory and also it slowly introducing the uh, new connectors through an educational process. But in addition to GEDS's plan, several of the manufacturers have come out with their own statements saying that this is what we intend to do starting in July of 2021 with the devices and in January with the adapters. Again, phasing out production, not stopping sale. It's a fine point, but I think it's important to remember that. Let's take a look at the global adoption stats, uh, status of these connectors. If you look in Europe, in the European Union, the ISO 80369 series dash three, those connectors are nearly 100% uh, adopted if in countries like the UK, Netherlands, France. Other countries are a little bit behind outside the EU. In Asia, we estimate conversion to be about 5%. I did mention that Japan started first with the NRFIT connector and later switched over and in, is in the process of adopting the Dash 3, the enteral feeding connector. China has begun its effort to pick up the enteral feeding connector, so it's in the process of conversion. Australia and New Zealand are basically the same as the European Union at over 90% adoption. Eastern Europe, Middle East, and, and Africa, with the exception of Israel, we estimate at about 30%. The Israelis are following closely behind Europe, approaching 100%. Um, over to the left, South America just began with uh, Brazil. That's a very influential country across the continent. So as Brazil goes, the rest of the continent will start picking up the adoption. And finally, in the upper left-hand corner, we have North America. We estimate uh, the conversion level to be about 30%. We rely on self-reporting from hospitals. Uh, so we're estimating at about 30%. 
However, in the top hospitals, we are estimating the conversion rate to be about 50%, and I'll go into more detail on that in a moment. Um, there is a law in California, it's called uh, Assembly Bill 444, and that makes it, uh, mandates the sale of compatible devices by manufacturers and the purchase of compatible devices by hospitals. Uh, that has led California to be probably one of the leading, if not the leading state in terms of adoption. I mentioned the top hospitals. This is the US News and World Report listing of the top 25 US gastroenterology hospitals. Many of you are familiar with this report and many of your hospitals your, may also be members of various uh, top 25 listings. This is the GI gastroenterology. You look here at UCLA, which is one example I picked out, number six. UCLA, UCLA completed its transition to the new connectors in November of last year. So right in the teeth of the pandemic. And their thinking was similar to what I articulated in that now was the most important time to convert because of the demands on the hospitals, the ICUs, and most importantly on the staff. Products that are going to be affected by this conversion start at the very top with the bag holding the enteral nutrition itself. And many of you, I would say here in North America, nearly everyone has made that conversion, perhaps unknowingly, with the adoption, the introduction of the Spike Plus connector used by all the major enteral nutrition manufacturers. Those are all incompatible with any other type of connector. So that's a way to begin the standardization process with the Spike Plus. Then moving on down towards the patient, feeding sets, enteral nutrition, extension sets, and feeding tubes all are going to be affected by this conversion to the ISO 80369-3 series of connectors. So some examples of feeding tubes that will be affected, a G, standard G tube, I'll talk in a moment about low profile because they have their own uh, niche of the, the regulations. NG tubes, NJ tubes, Y ports, all are going to be required to be compatible with the new standard. And I have pictured on the right-hand side in the circle an example of a male and female compliant connector. I mentioned that there's a, a slight uh, dispensation, different uh, situation for low profile feeding tubes are commonly called buttons, uh, brand names like McKee. That, that product, those products are exempt from compliance with NFIT at the device interface. So what does that mean? It means that where the giving set connects to the device, that connection is uh, not going to be compatible with NFIT because each of the manufacturers has its own proprietary uh, connector and therefore is exempt from compliance. However, at the other end where it connects to the admin set, all of those connectors will be ISO 80369-3 compliant. Other things you might not think about, other devices, such as bottle fill caps, fill straws, syringe caps, pre-filled syringes, all of those are going to be uh, compatible with and affected by the move from the legacy devices to the enteral uh, feeding, the new enteral feeding standard. Now, I'm not a technical person, uh, nor did I sleep at the Holiday Inn last night, so bear with me as I explain this in somewhat simple terms, but the way I keep this straight is that there's a bright line between devices that give something to the patient, in this case, enteral feeding nutrition or drugs through that particular port and devices that remove something from the patient. So devices that give are feeding tubes, for example. Devices that take are things like a Salem sump, which is used for drainage or decompression. So if it goes to the patient, it's, it has to be compatible with the new standards. If it takes from the patient, it will not be compatible, nor is it required to be compatible. So what that means that any device that's not labeled for enteral feeding will not have a connector, an ISO 80369-3 compliant connector. Examples of off-label tubes that are currently used for a variety of purposes in enteral feeding and are off-label are things like Foley catheters or red rubber catheters or other urinary catheters or devices. Those are not going to be required to be compliant. So um, forgive me for the simplistic approach to it, but that's how I remember what's going to be affected and what will not be affected. 
To help you uh, make this transition, we've put together a clinical advisory board. The clinical advisory board is made up of people just like you. So we have about 15 representatives from a broad array of backgrounds, nursing, physicians, pharmacists, dietitians, and others. And what these people have in common is that they've all participated directly in a conversion from legacy devices to the new NFIT compatible devices. And the idea here is that these people can provide you with practical advice based on their hard earned experience in making this transition. So likely they've already solved problems that you may yet encounter, or they can help you solve problems based on their experience in actually making a conversion. The way we'd like to work with the clinical advisory board is that if you contact us as a representative of your facility and you say you've got a problem, we'll work with the clinical advisory board to get you an advisor who's best suited for your problem. And then you can work directly with the peer and, and overcome whatever challenges you're facing. We also put together a list of transition tips based on their collective wisdom. Those tips are available on stayconnected.org. That's our website. So recall that our, uh, some of my goals were to help you get ready. We have created a process uh, and a timeline that we call aware, prepare, and adopt. Right now you're in the midst of the aware phase. You are being communicated to and, and, and understanding more about this situation and what needs to be done. The next step is to begin to prepare your organization with education and we uh, stand ready to help you. We've developed a whole raft of tools, resources that can help you get educated on what needs to be done, how it needs to be done. And then the last is to begin the adoption itself. So make the transition. So here are three recommendations I have for you based on my interactions with hospitals that have converted. The first and most important uh, step is to get two or three people that are going to be the, the, the chief engineers, the, the catalysts, the agents of change, establish those, those two or three people. That's first. Second is to set a stake in the ground by creating a go live date. Not that that has, to, it's not gonna be carved in stone, it may be postponed, but it's important to set a go live date and here's why. Manufacturers need to prepare to help you make the transition. The way they do that is they adjust their production schedules. If you have a go live date, they can build that into their production schedule. If you postpone your go live date, that's not a disaster because the manufacturers can take the, the uh, assigned production that they have forecasted for you and shift it to another converting hospital. What they don't do well with, what manufacturers don't do well with is a surprise and short-term notice. That is really tough for them to respond because these production lines are a bit like oil tankers. Once you get them up and going, it's hard to change their direction without a significant lead time. Next recommendation, develop a 90-day forecast. Uh, so post-conversion, you want to under help the manufacturers, your suppliers, understand what the demands on the production schedule is going to be and communicate that to them so that they can stand ready to help make sure that you have sufficient supplies of materials to make the conversion when you do finally make the shift. So those are my three recommendations. Local champions, set a go live date, get a 90-day forecast pulled together. As far as internally, once the product champions are set up, the next step is to communicate widely, cast the widest possible net, bring in anybody that it's affected. So don't, don't forget about stakeholders like the local VA, prisons if you work with them, assisted living facilities, rehab facilities, the home feeding companies, all of those people are going to be affected by the shift from the legacy devices to the new compliant devices. So have a big, have a big tent, meet often and communicate widely. And that'll become more and more important as the time rolls, as your calendar gets closer and closer to the go live date. I mentioned that we have a whole host of materials for you. Here's an example of one that we found particularly useful. It was developed by a California hospital early on in its conversion effort. We thought it was a good idea. So we did what lots of good marketers do and we stole it. Uh, what we did was we created a tri-fold 
here in the center of which is a patient infographic in one of two forms, a pediatric form or an adult form. There's other information listed on either side of the, the trifold. It folds up into a box that's about the size of a double stack pizza. And in what's important from your point of view is in that box are samples, free samples from GEDSA members. So you can actually, as an education tool, get hands-on experience with how the devices connect with one another and disconnect and how they are used to set up supply to a patient. So you can see on the two infographics, their insertion points for G-tubes, NJ-tubes, et cetera. Those are available from GEDSA at the Stay Connected website. In addition, we have vacuum cleaned the market uh, with hospitals that we've worked with for people that have converted to collect any good idea we could come across and develop those, formalize them into presentations, brochures, FAQs, and checklists. All this material is available for download, no charge. It's yours to use as you see fit at stayconnected.org. The only requirement that we have is that you, you give GEDSA credit as being the source for the material. You're free to rebrand it with your hospital's own logo or you can use it in its native form. But it's all available for you on stayconnected.org. In addition, we've made recordings of presentations from hospitals that have actually gone through the conversion process, what they've learned, what they do differently, what they would advise you to, to do. And these are available uh, on the stayconnected.org website. Um, most recently, I mentioned the ISMP presentation that was sponsored by one of our members, Avanos, that's available. And uh, just last Friday, we did a large one for Health Trust, uh, and that link will be available on the second. So these are, we, we try to keep them as current as possible. If we do any for any of you and you give us permission, we'll make them available as well. I, I pulled together a group of uh, supporting statements and articles that you can use when you're educating your institution on what's happening, why it's happening, and how it's happening. This, this uh, bibliography, if you think of it that way, is available um, on the website. You can have this as well to build your own presentations to your own organizations. So, Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Uh, I know you're, you're taking your time out of your work day. I am going to turn the presentation over to Natalie Bigler. Natalie will be our moderator and we'll enter the Q&A session. Thank you again. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. Thank you everyone who has made it to the Q&A. I would first off like to apologize. Uh, this is our first Zoom. So I know that some of your colleagues and some of our guests had gotten locked out. So we did go ahead and move to a Facebook Live for those folks. We've tried to share it. Um, we will get through the bumps and bruises of this as we do more of these. So let's go ahead and get into the Q&A. Um, as Mike said, we are going to move into this and you can ask questions in the Q&A and I can see some of those coming in. You can ask them in the chat if needed. I see that has come in and you can also raise your hand and we can go ahead and turn on your audio and you can ask your question that way. Our panelists who will be helping to answer these questions are folks who have been through the transition themselves. We are really grateful to have them here. They are from our clinical advisory board. We have Rua Abdelhadi. She is a doctor at Children's Mercy. Chris Filato is a pharmacist at North Carolina. Barb Fleming is a clinical nurse specialist at Lurie Children's in Chicago. Kim Gorsuch is a nurse supervisor and she is at Chicago as well. And Lorraine Linford, she is a nurse manager. She is at Intermountain Healthcare and Cynthia Reddick, a dietitian and national feeding tube manager at Quorum. So as we dive in, I'm gonna go ahead and try to give these questions over to the best panelists, but also some of them may have better questions that they think they can answer and we will let them dive in and take over. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with one of the questions from Steven. Can you please elaborate more on the 90 day forecast you recommended? Well, actually, I guess that would go towards Mike, um, but anyone from the clinical advisory board, you're also welcome to unmute yourself and dive in as well. Natalie, would you like me to respond first? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so thank you, uh, Steve, for that question. So the idea here is to help the manufacturer understand, your supplier understand what your needs are going to be in terms of the uh, requirements. So. Tip, you, I'm sure you have a run rate currently established with your supplier that's based on history, but there's going to be, uh, for a certain period of time post-conversion, there's going to be needs that you have in excess of your normal run rate. 
And those would be, for example, helping home feeding patients who want additional um, supplies. Syringes are probably the, the most important of which. Once you develop, you take your run rate and you bump it up a little bit and your manufacturer will work with you to help establish what that forecast is. That's what they're going to set their production schedule around. And what they don't want to do is get, have you get caught short. So the 90 day forecast would take into account safety stocks. It, it's, a, it's a total, not just a running rate, but it's a total uh, forecast for the entire product line. Um, your supplier should be able to, to give you what's called a crosswalk, which shows the, the legacy SKUs and the compliance SKUs. So you have, you can help with your supply chain and logistics people upload that information and know what products are going to be affected. So I'll stop there. And um, if there's other questions on forecasting later on, we can talk about that. Thank you, Mike. Um, I'm going to take a question from the chat. Karen asks, do you have any study of hospital costs or savings due to the change in NFA, incorporating the change of non-dedicated tubes for nutrition, leaven type tubes such as nasogastric tube? Um, any clinical advisory boards, you can pipe in with studies that you know of. I am not 100% sure, but I do know that there was an article by Peggy Gunter from Aspen, who talked about some of the costs that are actually have been by not doing the conversion. And I can share that post webinar. Um, and we can also put this in the chat if possible. Uh, does anyone have any feedback on that studies they know of? Okay. Um, Emily, another, this is Mike. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, the only comment I'll make is on the costs. To the best of my knowledge, there's no cost increase uh, associated with the conversion from the legacy device connectors to the intro feeding connectors. I think the manufacturers are making like for like. I won't claim comprehensive knowledge, but that's my understanding. Uh, so that cost is a moot point. Okay, some more questions coming in. Um, Anonymously, isn't the ISO standard driven by regulatory agencies, but GEDSA is driving NFIT specifically? Mike, would you like to take that? Oh, Barb, you also raise your hand. I will ask to unmute you. My apologies. Natalie, did you call me on that one? Um, anyone can speak up. I am asking to unmute from our panelists so that they can all speak. Sure, okay. Mike, you can go ahead on, on this one as they do. Can, um, Natalie, can you repeat the question, the this emphasis? Yes, um, it was that isn't the ISO standard driven by regulatory agencies, but GEDSA is driving NFIT specifically. So I think maybe that is more of a mic question, but I can sure. just jump in if you'd like. So, so the, the actual standards are being driven by ISO itself. Uh, they're the ones who created it. They're the ones who identified the problem. They're the ones who convened the working groups that developed the standards. The regulatory agencies are supporting it from the standpoint of, yeah, we think this is a good idea. Um, with respect to GEDSA, you know, what we decided as a group early on was instead of every manufacturer creating its own uh, connector, um, GEDSA felt it would be efficient to get behind a single standard, and, and we gave that a name. So that name is NFIT. But there are GEDSA members that have their own ISO 80369 compliant connectors. And, the, and the, the standard is that you can, as a manufacturer, you can sell a connector so long as it meets the standard. So you can say it's compliant with the standard if you can demonstrate that in fact you're compliant with the standard. So while uh, the, the standard that gets us united behind called NFIT is one, it's not the only one. So also I should point out no regulatory agency anywhere has mandated that this change happen. 
They're all strongly supportive of it and all the changes in the countries I mentioned are all being supported with the exception of Japan. All of these changes have been driven by the manufacturers following the ISO regulations. In the case of Japan, the Ministry of Health mandated that this happen and so it happened. Thank you, Mike. Um, we have a question regarding low dose tip syringes. So uh, the ISO 20695 group removed the low dose tip syringe from the normative requirements and des designated it as an alternative dose syringe, highlighting some of the concerns that have emerged from the inaccurate dosing of the syringes at lower doses. How does GEDSA slash NFIT plan to address on these ongoing concerns of inaccurate dosing for our smallest patients? Uh, I believe Chris Blotto is gonna take that one from pharmacy. Yeah, hi, this is Chris. Um, so my background is I'm the clinical manager for the pediatric pharmacy and I've been involved uh, in pediatric pharmacy since 2002. Um, specifically regarding the low-dose tip syringe, actually the low-dose tip syringe really helped um, address the issue that we had with inaccurate dosing. Um, I think the, the only concerns, we've been implemented for over two years wow. and the only issues with inaccuracies um, that I've been able to see have actually been when we've had discrepancies with how when we are using these doses to be given orally versus uh -huh. through a tube. Uh, but overall, we have not seen any issues there, and we've been pretty pleased um, with the accuracy of the syringes. Thank you, Chris. And Barb, I heard you say anything. Did you have anything to add on that topic? Oh, I can you guys hear me? I'm having some audio problems. Yeah. Yes. Oh, perfect. Um, I was going to say that um, when we converted using the low dose tip syringes, we have not found them to be inaccurate. They um, have been very accurate. Um, I think there's some initial confusion because the initial NFIT syringe that was not low dose tip, that was not accurate. And I think people reading through various information about NFIT may get confused between the original design and now the final design, the low dose tip, but they work very well. And I work in a NICU and we give very, very small doses where um, every small volume amount is very important to us and they've been accurate. This is Dr. Abdul Hadi from Children's Mercy, Kansas City, and I would like to echo uh, Barbara's uh, experience at our hospital, neonatal um, uh, unit, and uh, taking care of infants, very small size infants requiring very small doses. We have not come across um, uh, in, uh, inaccurate uh, uh, delivery uh, or any problems, and I do agree with Barbara. This is in reference to the latest design of the low dose uh, syringes. So I. Um, I share the exact same experience as Barbara's. All right, thank you. Um, I am just kind of going to questions as we see them. So someone is currently working on conversion and so far I have seen almost no price increases for all of the 50 or so products we are converting. Okay, so that was in response to the prices earlier. Thank you for that. Um, any advice? for how to reach others outside the hospital systems to community and governmental partners, i.e. prisons. I will let any member of the clinical advisory board who has recommendations on that jump in and Mike, you as well. Sure. Well, I'll start by saying one thing that we can do, one step that we can take to help uh, that is we can work with a local hospital to conduct a virtual summit just like this for you and your stakeholders so that we can bring everyone to the same place at the same time and educate the leaders of the various stakeholders so that everybody is on the same page moving forward as what's going on with, with the uh, conversion to the new standards. So that would be one first step that I could think of. Okay, Lorraine, did you also have a comment? I don't know if that was you raising your hand. I did. Um, okay. So one very small thing that we did was that when patients were discharged, and um, I should reference this, um, this was from a, a large trauma center, and when we were sending patients out to long-term care facilities and skilled nursing facilities, we included in their discharge packet a one-page sheet that explained what NFIT was. 
And um, at one point in time, we actually did even send some syringes at our first point of transition. We would send one or two syringes with them just so that there was some connectivity um, until they could order on their own. But over time, we were able to evolve away from that. But it's just one of those, you do have to be aware that they will not have what they need to connect and whether that's, and, and, and to let them know ahead of time what's coming to them as a patient. Um, this is Barb Fleming from the Children's Hospital in Chicago again. Um, I echo that same comment. I think it's one thing to do a hospital conversion, but this impacts the families and patients and children at home. And so it's really important to work with your um, case management group, DME group, um, and community groups to, to communicate that this is when your hospital's transitioning to NFIT and what is their plans. And be careful um, using words like NFIT compatible and being NFIT are actually two different things. NFIT compatible is taking legacy items and putting a bunch of connectors together versus truly being NFIT. Um, but communicating that with your um, partners is giving them a heads up that this is what will be ordered for home care and they need to be on board as well. We also sent um, a NFIT letter to like about 2,000 of our families who had been in our hospital for um, related to a gastrostomy tube or a feeding tube of some kind in the last couple of years to give them a heads up that we will be using NFIT so that when they came into the hospital, they would be aware of that. And it also provided a case manager's name and phone number to help families transition their supplies at home. Kim, did you have a comment? did, thank you. Um, so hi everybody, my name is Kim Gorsuch. When our facility uh, transitioned a few years back, I was that person. So whenever our patients went home with NFIT, I was their point of contact. Um, our patients were from all over the US, so it wasn't like I could just call the hospital down the road and let them know what we were doing. So we had, you know, a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C 